Hello and welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Vivian Allred, naturopathic nutritional therapist and hormone enthusiast. If you want to learn how to rebalance your female hormones, regulate your menstrual cycle and reclaim your vitality, then you are in the right place. Each week I will be delving into different conditions such as PCOS, endometriosis, infertility, hypothyroidism, acne and hair loss. Stay tuned for interviews with expert guests, Q&As and solo episodes that are all intended to help you move from hormonal chaos to hormonal harmony. If you'd like to submit a question for me to answer on the podcast, then you can email them to hormonesinharmony at gmail.com. The information shared on this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and is not designed to replace the advice of your health practitioner. That said, let's get into today's episode. Hello guys, welcome back to episode number 24 of the podcast and today is another solo Q&A episode and I'm going to be covering two pretty different subjects so I think you'll get a lot out of these. I deliberately try and choose the ones which we've not covered yet so a lot of people do deal with similar things so whether that's thyroid issues, energy, PCOS, acne and I've covered them multiple times so I purposely chose some ladies questions who are dealing with some some subjects that we've not actually touched on in a lot of detail yet. I'll get on to the questions in a moment but I want to start off by saying thank you so much for all of your support with the podcast. You're all sending me lots of messages on Instagram and email saying how much you're enjoying the episodes which is absolutely amazing and you're loving the guests that I've chosen and again I'm purposely trying to switch it up a little bit and not have people who have the same ideas as as me because it's good to get different perspectives and different opinions in this industry and I think a lot of other podcasts they kind of just have the same people same types of beliefs and even though it may seem confusing to you the listener I'm not trying to confuse you I'm actually trying to provide you with all different sides of the argument all different types of information and mindset so that you can choose what you believe is right for you because ultimately you know your body best and everyone is different so just take all the information with a pinch of salt even the the information that I share it's obviously credible information but make sure that you don't just follow one person's advice and recommendations make sure that you read different things from different perspectives and I think I try and do that quite successfully and I'll continue to do that with the podcast as well. As always you can request information, you can recommend guests or if there's any type of content or subjects that you'd like me to focus on, if you'd like more videos, more subjects for podcasts that haven't yet been covered, I'm always open to implementing certain things and give you guys what you're asking for. If you send me a DM or an email, if there's something I've not yet covered, and again, you can continue to send in your questions for these podcast Q&As. So the first question for today is from a lady called Ashley, and she's 21 years old. Her message is, hi Vivian, since I was 15, I've been struggling, struggling with chronic vaginal thrush that doesn't seem to improve with any natural or conventional treatments that I've tried. After reading some of your blog posts and content, I don't believe that I'm struggling with hormone imbalances. My periods are pain-free and regular, so I'm not quite sure what could be contributing to my ongoing issues. The only real symptom that I'm dealing with are occasional headaches, sugar cravings, and what feels like a low immune system. I'm constantly picking up bugs and germs from my job. She's a nursery worker, so she's working with children all day long. I don't remember what initially triggered my yeast infections at age 15, but They do tend to flare up when I'm due to start my period. So far, I've tried a lot of different things, probiotics, creams, both natural and medicated, removing sugar and caffeine from my diet, using gentle hypoallergenic wash and shower gels. The only thing that has seemed to improve it slightly was coming off the pill last year, as I've heard that wasn't the best for long-term health. But But it still didn't resolve it completely like I thought it would, so I'm a little bit stuck. I eat a healthy diet, avocado on toast for breakfast with a banana, frittata or omelette with sweet potato and a naked snack bar for lunch. For those who don't know, they're basically fruit and nut bars. Fruit for snacks and bolognese with brown rice noodles and kale for dinner 
with a few squares of dark chocolate afterwards, sometimes another snack bar or a few dates as well. I mainly drink water throughout the day, but have a juice before I go to work, which has apple, kale, pear, orange and spinach, and a few bottles of wine at the weekend. I would love to exercise more, but over the past few months I've let this slide, as I've been too uncomfortable to train when my symptoms flare up, and I have been become unmotivated. Hoping you can provide some recommendations and point me in the direction of what I could try next. So, Ashley, yeah, it seems like you've tried a lot and some really good things. So the probiotics, the reducing sugar, caffeine, not so much, but it's always good, especially if you're using um, maybe some sweeteners or sugars in there as well. And if you've got any kind of um, the headaches that you're dealing with, then caffeine, eliminating that can absolutely help. It sounds like you have some type of yeast overgrowth, which is probably obvious. That's what thrush is. But instead of just focusing on the vaginal yeast and constantly trying to do topical things and focus on that alone, I think piecing together the other symptoms that you're dealing with, so you may not even feel like they're connected. So the headaches, sugar cravings, vaginal yeast, they don't really sound connected, but they absolutely are. And if you're struggling with vaginal yeast infections that are occurring and they're not improving at all, regardless of what you do, then for me, that's a pretty big indicator that there's some sort of yeast overgrowth in the gut. The most common is candida. And this is something that we all have. Candida is not a bad guy. It's not a, it's not a negative thing when it's in balance with the rest of your digestive system and your microbiome. We all have it in small amounts and it's actually known as an opportunistic organism. So when the rest of our bacteria, the parasites, the viruses that we all have living on and in our bodies, when that's all working fine and there's probably 80% good guys, 20% bad guys, because we need some bad guys to kind of keep us in check. It's like having a child if they're never exposed to any bullies or any negativity in their life, they're wrapped up in cotton wool, then they're never going to thrive in the real world so it's the same with our gut we can't expect it to be absolutely perfect and filled with good bacteria because that can actually make us more susceptible to having problems when we do encounter some sort of pathogen so the goal here isn't to eliminate yeast completely and actually trying to do that would actually make the symptoms and the whole condition worse in the long run your history of the oral contraceptive pill maybe some stress going on, the alcohol intake and hormones can absolutely drive it. And I know that you said that you're not really struggling with hormonal symptoms, but you could still have hormonal imbalances and either not recognize that you have symptoms of that, um, such as fatigue or the headaches that you're having, or it could just be subtle changes that are just driving the issue. Actually, the birth control pill, because you noticed that it benefited you from coming off that then that's another reason that you may have improved your symptoms when stopping that because excess estrogen can actually exacerbate and fuel the growth of any yeast infections in the gut or the vagina and it's sometimes due to the the slight ph changes in the in the vagina making it more susceptible to grow yeast or bacterial vaginosis those types of things same on the skin on other parts of your body it needs to be in a tightly controlled ph and if it's too acidic or too alkaline then the microbiome on the skin can start to overgrow or become imbalanced similar to what it would in the gut as well so everything needs to be in homeostasis in the body the blood pressure the blood sugar the ph electrolyte balance Everything is tightly regulated. Therefore, if something's thrown off from stress, lifestyle changes, diet, medication, then a lot of different things can start to fall apart and then have a knock-on effect on everything else in the body. Now, instead of just going ahead and treating the infection like it was candida and following an anti-candida diet and all of these different supplements, it's important to actually find out if that's definitely the case. I'm saying that there's a high likelihood that it is because of the symptoms and because it's vaginal yeast based, but it could be a bacteria or parasite in the gut 
or just inflammation in general that's suppressing your immune system and allowing the vaginal yeast to take over. So a lot of people who are struggling with yeast-based symptoms, they can often be struggling with other organisms, not just yeast. And these different these different pathogens all have different weaknesses and they all require slightly different protocols. There's some general things that help to eradicate them and rebalance the gut in general, but there are some specifics that are more suitable for yeast or parasite or bacteria. So I would say testing is quite important in this case. There is the option of stool testing, which is probably my most preferred, using something like the GI map, which doesn't just look at pieces of the stool under a microscope to see if the researchers can actually see something in there but they look for DNA fragments of this organism as well. So even if they can't see it, if they can pick up parts of DNA present in the stool, then there's, um, there's obviously something there that needs to be addressed. This test is, is quite expensive, so it's around £300, but that won't just look at the yeast, it'll look at things like H. pylori, um, dysbiosis so imbalance of good and bad bacteria so that would be the ideal place to start obviously some people can't afford something like that so the next best thing would be an organic acid organic acid test this is a urine based test and the good thing about it is that it doesn't just look at digestive function so it would look at nutrient deficiencies it would look at protein metabolism mitochondrial function and your gut health as well so this would be obviously less invasive to do. It's pretty simple and easy and you get a lot more information for, I think it's probably half the price of the stool test. So around £150. And this would look at markers of fungal and yeast overgrowth. It's also good in the fact that it won't just look at digestive-based yeast. It would look at if there's any yeast anywhere else in the system because it's all got, got to be cleared by the liver, the kidneys, and come out through the urine. So if it shows high, it could mean that it's just coming back from the, the vaginal yeast infections, or it could be located in the gut, which is a little bit tricky to understand. But if you've got high yeast, then you still need to do something about that. One of the most common mistakes that I see people making is that they go on these anti-candida, really low-carb, low-sugar, just basically meats, fish, vegetables and eggs for weeks and weeks, if not months. And they do see some symptomatic improvement because they are taking away a lot of the fuel source for these bugs. But long term, they're not actually looking at why they got this in the first place. They're not really addressing the root cause of it. And instead, they're just doing what the conventional treatments are, is just suppressing the symptoms and trying to constantly deal with the symptoms. And if it keeps coming back, then again there's obviously something that's not being addressed and you're going to keep going in this vicious cycle and with yeast the more that you treat it the more it becomes virulent so it becomes more pathogenic harder to kill it becomes more resistant to the treatments that you give it so if you're going to treat yeast make sure you do it right and you do it within one or two rounds of treatment because it's just going to be stronger and harder to kill the longer this goes on my approach to yeast overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth in the gut is to limit a lot of the refined carbohydrates. I think we should all be doing this anyway, sugars, processed packaged foods. Sometimes a short period of time reducing the complex starchy carbs, especially if someone's reacting negatively to them in terms of brain fog, bloating, digestive upset, and they just don't feel good consuming them at the time being. I support with digestive enzymes, stomach acid sometimes, and just a lower intake of those foods. And I'm not a fan of really restrictive low-carb diets because even though carbohydrates and glucose is the main fuel for candida and other pathogens, it's not the only one. And there's actually studies and evidence to support that these organisms can actually consume the amino acids from the gut lining. So it can start to eat away at our own tissue if you go into ketosis so you're running off fat instead of carbohydrates they can actually be fueled by ketones as well so it's not about taking away the fuel source it's about making the gut an inhospitable place to survive for them this is a multi-step process and 
it's not just about the gut as well. You need to make sure that the rest of the body is functioning optimally. So if there is excess estrogen in the body, making sure that we are supporting the detoxification of that. If you're really stressed, you've got really high cortisol, you're not sleeping, you're eating foods that you're sensitive to, you have nutrient deficiencies, then the yeast may go temporarily or symptoms may be suppressed temporarily, but long term, they're just going to come back with a vengeance and you're just going to be constantly treating these things, which is a waste of time, money, and it's obviously very stressful as well. With your diet then, you're eating quite good foods, so you're not eating a lot of junk foods, which is good. One thing I would say is just the amount of hidden sugar that you probably aren't aware that you're consuming. So with your breakfast, the banana, with the toast, maybe cut back on one of those a little bit. And the naked snack bars, if you actually look at the grams of sugar in there, it can be a little bit surprising. And I'd much rather you eat naked bars than Snickers bars or junk food but if you're dealing with something like candida overgrowth you'd want to limit just these extra hidden sources of sugar that could potentially be fueling the issue and it's not the sugar that's the problem it's your body and the the infection that's the issue same with the juice that you're consuming um there's not many vegetables in that it's mainly fruit based so maybe switch that out for a herbal tea or a protein packed smoothie for the time being if you really enjoy it, you can reintroduce that after a couple of weeks. But you just want to give your body the best environment that it can and just a short-term temporary therapeutic diet to reduce symptoms and reduce the overall fuel for this infection. Stress is also crucial to get under control because if cortisol is high, that's going to favour the, the overgrowth of bad bacteria the negative species in the gut and it's going to suppress the good bacteria. It can also promote intestinal permeability which is the the leaky gut syndrome that you've probably heard about and it also suppresses gut-based immunity so your secretory IgA that is your gut-based immunity your your immune defense in the gut and when that's low we become more susceptible to candida overgrowth, to SIBO, to parasites, food, food poisoning food sensitivities developing. So when someone's had chronic stress or some people are just genetically predisposed to having low secretory IgA, like myself, then we need to do all that we can to boost that up so the body's own natural immune defences can tackle some of these overgrowths from occurring. The alcohol may be an issue as well. So a couple of bottles of alcohol each weekend it may not seem a lot to you, I'm not sure, but it is definitely quite excessive, especially if you're drinking it all in two days and then not having anything for the week. Plus the alcohol can be fuel for the bacteria and the yeast infections. And someone with yeast overgrowth can be sensitive to yeast containing foods and drinks and certain molecules in the foods. So like histamines, tyramines, sulfites, So if you can, I would really recommend cutting some of these things out for a short period of time. Instead, like I mentioned, consuming more herbal teas. I know that sounds a little bit boring, but think of the benefits for your body rather than the negatives. And some of them actually taste really good. And I know it's not alcohol, it doesn't really give you the same effect, but we just need to provide the body with the resources and the environment it needs to rebuild, rebalance and thrive. And then we can start to reintroduce some of these things in a bit more moderation. Herbal teas like powder arco, ginger are very beneficial for someone who's dealing with a yeast or bacterial overgrowth in the gut that actually have antifungal properties, antibacterial properties and the anti-inflammatory as well. Other anti-yeast foods include coconut, so having coconut oil, cooking with that, coconut milk based curries or smoothies coconut shreds with maybe some nuts and seeds as like a little trail mix for a snack and then in your food adding as much fresh herbs garlic turmeric and drinking bone broth as well these are all very supportive to gut health the coconut contains lauric acid which is antimicrobial and the herbs contain natural antimicrobial compounds Bone broth helps to boost the secretory IgA I just mentioned about and it's very healing and nourishing to the gut lining as well. It may also be worth doing a short-term 
antimicrobial treatment, like a protocol with some herbs. I would highly recommend working with a practitioner on this because you just need access to the best quality supplements that aren't really available on Amazon or health food stores. The best type are usually practitioner grade and they don't want just anyone getting hold of them and supplementing because they can be dangerous if you take them with certain medications or take them at the wrong dose. And you'd really want to keep it short term. So I'm talking four to six weeks of things like Allicin, which is the standard extract in garlic, oregano, neem, undesilinic acid, caprylic acid. And then I personally like to use probiotics, a combination of megaspore probiotic, which is a spore forming probiotic and if you go back a couple of episodes you can listen to my um, my podcast with Kiran Krishnan we talk all about megaspore and the benefits and why I choose that over some of the conventional probiotics that are available just on the shelf if your probiotic is refrigerated then what benefits is that going to give your gut and your body if it has to survive through stomach acid and your body temperature that's just what we talk about on the episode and some of the myths regarding these conventional probiotics, which were really developed on minimal information about the gut microbiome. And now that most come out, there's so much more information that we're aware of and much more effective products that we can use. So Megaspore would be really helpful. That actually helps to improve your diversity of gut bacteria and remember, the more good guys there are, the less room there is for bad guys. So it's like a car park. The more cars are in the car parking space, then the less room there is for some other guys to come in. So you really want to crowd out the negative species and the bad guys. Another one is Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast-based probiotic, and that may seem counterintuitive. Why would I want to add more yeast if it's already overgrown? So this is actually a yeast that fights candida and other funguses in the body. So it can be really beneficial. I've seen really quite good results with that as well. Lifestyle wise, then focusing on stress, like I mentioned, sleep, because if you're not sleeping well, then your cravings, your appetite, your hormones the next day or two are going to be depleted. You're going to be craving more sugar, more starches and those cravings will kind of put you in a vicious cycle you're going to feed the pathogen the pathogenic overgrowth so you're getting more cravings from your gut bacteria and you're getting more cravings because your hormones have been thrown off as well i'm going to mention organ meats because you know i love some liver and some lamb hearts and just the nutrients that you can get from those things is going to be really helpful for your immune system so through all of this, you want to remember that your immune system is the thing to be supporting because 80% of it is located in your gut. And the, the role of it is to really support the infections and the balance of species in your gut as well. So organ meats, things like gelatinous meats, eggs, these all contain fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E and K which are so important for immune function and the motility and the lining of your gut as well. I'd also recommend topically doing some research into um, vaginal probiotics and creams. One particular brand that I like to use and product is um, by Bioca in the UK and it's called Servagine. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well, but that's a topical cream that you can use and it contains lactobacillus with garlic and rose oil as well. So that will help to kind of calm the area down and rebalance the microflora of the vagina without really killing off everything in the area like some of these antibacterial creams can do because if you're killing off all the good guys as well, then that's going to be more... It's going to leave you more open and susceptible for the yeast to overgrow as well. It's like when you take antibiotics, that's when you're most, most likely to develop yeast infections and fungal toenails and things because that's an opportunity for all these organisms to overgrow. So we really want to kill them off slightly and kind of prune the overgrowth, but then also supporting with beneficial nutrients 
and really soothing symptom relieving nutrients as well. I also recommend looking into homemade probiotic pessaries and this may sound a little strange but I'll include a recipe or a little guide in the show notes to some ingredients to look into. I like the ingredients like cacao butter, coconut oil and essential oils to insert into the vagina. You make them in a little mold in the freezer and insert them. And the essential oils are things that are going to be antimicrobial. So you need to be really careful about the quality and not overdoing this as well. But they can be really effective and I've seen good results with that. If you go back on my Instagram profile, so at Viva Natural Health, if you look at my Instagram highlights, I actually did a whole story education on yeast and fungal overgrowth. So we go into a bit more detail than we have today. And there's a lot more information and recommendations about the topical care, things to look for with your um, hygiene products and your underwear, because if you're using products that have um, endocrine disrupting chemicals or phthalates or they have foaming actions and they're killing a lot of the bacteria and they can be really irritating especially if things are fragrance like your tampons or your pads that you're using it might be good to maybe swap to a menstrual cup organic sanitary products or just kind of free bleeding um if you can if you can get away with that maybe just using an unbleached pad or a cotton cloth pad so that you're really minimizing the in, the exposure of your vagina to some of these chemicals in the products. And look at your laundry detergent as well. If that's quite chemical filled, then that's going to be lingering on the menstrual products and your underwear that you're using. Okay, next question is from Kaylee, who's 27. Hi, just wanted to start off by saying that I'm loving your podcast and eagerly wait each week for a new episode to be released. I really appreciate the work that you do and the content you create. It is so refreshing to hear someone provide science-backed information and who isn't trying to sell me something all the time. The issue I have is that I'm struggling to see any results from the gym, despite training hard for five days a week. I would say that I am 10 to 20 pounds over my ideal weight and I have already managed to lose 15 pounds from changing my diet to a healthy paleo style diet. My breakfast is eggs with vegetables, lunch is chicken thighs with a large salad and avocado oil mayo, dinner is fish or red meat with sweet potato, steamed vegetables and then coconut yogurt and dark chocolate for dessert. I've always been quite active but I really had to cut back last year due to an injury and some hormonal issues I was dealing with. Since getting back into it again I really don't feel like I'm progressing like I had done in the past. And it doesn't feel like I'm seeing any physical changes. I know that health isn't about what you look like, but I feel like my body weight isn't healthy as I'm storing it mainly around my belly. I'm doing two spin classes per week, two hit sessions, often followed by 45 minutes of strength training and one very heavy lifting day with my PT. I'm considering upping my workouts to six days a week but I'm concerned this may be too much as I've heard you talk about the potential dangers of exercising too much. But I feel like my body will tolerate this well as I used to train a lot more frequently in my early 20s. What would your advice be? Dial in my diet a bit more and start to track my macros or adding more exercise or different types? Thank you in advance. Okay, so there's a lot going on here and this is a similar picture to what I see all the time. We need to remember that exercise is a stressor. Even though it's a good stress, it's a positive stress. It's called eustress um, as opposed to distress, which is a negative type. We need to remember that more isn't better. If our stress bucket is already filled up with full-time job, we have kids, we have hormone imbalances, we have nutrient deficiencies, we're traveling a lot, then our bucket is already pretty full and adding just that extra little stress, whether it's restricting calories a little bit, doing a bit more cardio or intermittent fasting, more isn't better and it can actually just tip you over the edge and be the straw that breaks the camel's back. If you're on Instagram and constantly seeing fitness influencers 
looking good, looking like they're crushing it and doing it all, looking really healthy and fit and lean and promoting this way of living, uh, we need to remember that that's their full-time job a lot of the time, that in the gym, multiple hours per day, they have people helping them with the business, the people cooking for them, they're getting some free products and they often don't have the stress of family life and another job to deal with and the stress bucket is sometimes a lot less full than the normal person quote so if you're constantly looking at other people or comparing yourself to what you were in your early 20s we need to remember that your body changes as you get older and that doesn't mean that you need to not go to the gym at all and sit in your couch all day long watching tv because you're getting older absolutely not the body is resilient and we need to remember that it's not a delicate little flower that we can't really push or um, challenge a little bit you're already doing a lot of things you're doing a lot of different workouts um your diet's already pretty healthy so a small change isn't going to be beneficial it's like when you're eating a meal if you're still struggling with health issues adding in one extra piece of broccoli or one more serving of healthy fat per day isn't going to be the thing that makes the big shift it's usually foundational issues that are the big things that make the biggest changes and move the needle a lot quicker and faster you're doing all of the right things so obviously something isn't working for you and it, insanity is the definition of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result what you're doing obviously isn't working for you so doing more of it still isn't going to work so you need to take that into consideration and realize that maybe what you need to do is less of what you are doing in terms of diet maybe loosening your diet up a little bit eating a little bit more cutting back on the workouts in terms of frequency duration or the types of exercise that you're doing and just trying something new the fact that you're storing your weight in your midsection is another sign of stress so cortisol is a hormone which is our main stress hormone it's produced by the adrenal glands which govern our stress response in the body and there are more stress and cortisol receptors in the abdomen than anywhere else in the body and that's actually from a protective evolutionary mechanism think about it if we were cavemen back in the day ten thousand years ago or whatever it was if we were stressed because of a famine, because of a war, because we were living in an environment that was dangerous, then the place that we would store our fat would want to be around the abdomen because that's where the, the main vital organs are, are living. So our hearts in that area, our gut, our liver. So our body directly stores it in that area to save our life. And although our lives have completely changed and we're not having those life-threatening stresses as frequently, the chronic low-grade stresses of the 21st century modern life is still providing the same response in the body. So the fact that you're still not getting the results you want, you're holding weight in the, the belly area, you've had some history of injuries. I'm not sure if that's from overtraining or poor posture or something like that. But my goal is to, but my recommendation is to really dial things back. And I really think that's going to be beneficial for you. I'd want to ask why are you training so hard in the first place? What, what are you training for? Is it so that you can get six pack abs? Is it for a competition? Is it for pictures on social media? Really look and dig into why you're doing this. Are you actually enjoying it or are you doing it to punish your body so that you can look good and fit the aesthetic, ideal body goals that we're all trained to believe that we should be aiming for? How long are your sessions? Are you doing two hours a day? The fact that you're doing two hit sessions a week followed by strength training, that's that in alone is too much so the hit sessions should be 15 to 20 minutes maximum and then that should be your workout done the fact that you're staying for another workout that's all the training so i'm not sure what else you're doing the rest of the week how long the heavy training session is 
for people dealing with cortisol issues i like to limit their workouts to 30 to 45 minutes because at that 45 minute mark is when cortisol and your stress hormones peak and when that happens your body stops burning the fat and instead it goes into a stress state and it holds on to things instead in your early 20s if you felt like you were doing well you were crushing it in the gym you were probably running off adrenaline and this is common too people feel that high of exercise after they go for a run or lift really heavy get their heart rate really high and um, get really sweaty during the workouts they, they take that as a sign as a good workout and if they're not pumping with sweat if they don't feel like they're going to die then they believe that they didn't work out hard, hard enough and that is not true at all a walk gentle brisk walk often provides better results than workouts like that and the people who tend to go for the extreme workouts the boot camps hit crossfit are the type of people who are more go 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 they love the adrenaline rush they're already pretty stressed and live stress lifestyles so it keeps them feeling good and keeps the energy levels high but it's actually because of stress hormones not because it's actually benefiting their body and usually those type of people actually benefit more from restorative exercise walking like i mentioned yoga pilates and at first they'll feel like that's the the worst thing that they could do it feels like that wasting the time not going to provide results but as they continue with that and really cut back on the strenuous exercise they often find that the weight comes off naturally because they're not stressing their body the hormones and the metabolism are a lot happier and more balanced so keep that in mind as well. Other signs that you may be dealing with to maybe indicate that you're overtraining would be puffy kind of water retention, um, especially if it's worse in the morning, you just wake up in your face or your ankles are really puffy because when your body is struggling, the adrenal glands are struggling, then this affects your electrolyte and your mineral balance in the body plus the inflammation if you're not giving yourself ample time to recover and repair after workouts then this will lead to inflamed muscles and inflamed joints and when we're inflamed we tend to retain more water to kind of dilute some of the inflammatory cytokines in the body think about it when you sprain your ankle it draws water to the area to kind of help repair that so that could be happening all throughout the body as well other symptoms, you could feel like you're never recovered. So if you're constantly sore and tired and there's not a day where a body part isn't aching, maybe you're constantly thinking about exercise or thinking about your food. Maybe your appetite's changed. So it, either it could be really high and that's usually due to the stress. So when people are stressed, they can eat more or they could go the opposite way and have a really low appetite and feel like they're fine they're not requiring more food um so that could be a problem either way um because of the stress hormones uh, fatigue insomnia if you're clenching your jaw if you catch yourself grinding your teeth in the night or just catch yourself in the middle of the day clenching your jaw breakouts and if your menstrual cycle get starts to get thrown off then that's the the best way to see to see how much stress this is causing you because your period is your monthly report card it'll teach you about how well you're taking care of the body of your body and keep in mind that the period that you have this month is often due to the the lifestyle and the nutrition factors from one to three months ago so it's not always what you've done this month it's often what you've done in months prior so start to make changes and maybe keep a track of how your periods improve how your sleep improves maybe start sleep tracking and i recommend switching your exercise over to more of that restorative form that i mentioned you can still stick with strength training 30 to 45 minutes maximum maybe a couple of times a week with your personal trainer but maybe talk about cutting the weight down a little bit and incorporating more rest periods less reps more recovery days so at least two recovery days a week is necessary for pretty much everyone make sure you're sleeping you're eating nutrient dense foods maybe eating more foods because you're eating some healthy fats and really high quality protein but 
I would still up the calories. So at breakfast, eggs and veggies, m- make sure you're having like three eggs, maybe add an avocado to that and maybe some fruit as well. Your lunches are pretty fine. Um, the salad that you're having, but I would add some carbohydrates to that because it's just basically protein and fiber. Try and include some carbohydrates at each meal to keep your blood sugar levels stable and your hormones healthy and make sure that you're recovering well from that exercise too. It may be worth tracking your calories for at least a couple of days to see where you're at. You want to be reaching a minimum of around 2,000 a day, depending on your height and your weight. I'm not sure um, what those are, but for most women, 2,000 calories per day is a good place to shoot for. But for someone who's recovering from over-exercising, who's dealing with hypothalamic amenorrhea, so the periods stop because of stress, or someone who's just been overeating and requires more nutrients, then that can get up to 2,500, up to 3,000 some cases. So it's good to know where you're at. And once you've tried for a couple of days, then just delete the app. You don't need to become obsessed with that. Instead of going to the gym, now you're tracking your food and weighing things. Please don't do that. Just listen to your intuition. It may be difficult at first because hormones have been suppressed and you've been maybe pushing through some of your body signals and symptoms for a long period of time. So things can be a little bit inaccurate, but over time you'll start to notice that you become more in sync with your body. You can understand what what works well, what doesn't. Keep a food journal, keep a symptom journal. And then over time you can piece all this information together And find out what works for you in this current moment because we all change throughout our life. Even in a year, something that works now maybe won't work next year. And something that worked last year won't work now because hormones change, circumstances change, and we shouldn't get tied down to something that has worked in the past. We are meant to adapt, we're fluid, things change and we need to be adaptive and change with that as well so don't be tied to the workouts that you were doing the diet that's worked in the past you may require something different and it definitely seems like you do need that so with your diet changes you're looking towards the more low carb at this moment so start slowly increasing your intake of carbohydrates obviously the healthy types the carbs the the starchy carbs the gluten-free grains if you tolerate them, fruits, root vegetables are all great and especially around your workouts to recover and replenish that glycogen store that's been depleted during the workouts. Cut back your exercise, stick with three to four days a week, maximum 45 minutes, mainly strength training with a lot of walking. So I'm talking 30 to 60 minutes every single day, getting those 10,000 steps in. We are designed as humans to walk. If you can get outside and do that in nature, then that's even better. Walking actually reduces our stress hormones and our cortisol, whereas the other types of exercise increase them. So we're not just getting active, we're getting vitamin D, we're getting nature therapy, and we're getting a reduction in stress hormones at the same time. So Stick in your headphones, listen to some music, listen to a podcast, clear your head. And this, I can guarantee this will be much more beneficial for your mental health, for your hormones and for your metabolism and weight as well in the long run. You can also look into cycle syncing. So I've mentioned this on my blog um, multiple times. So I have some blog posts on this. I have a free guide on the download section of my website that anyone can grab. And this talks about how your energy, your needs, your self-care, how this can fluctuate throughout the cycle. So we have four phases with our cycle. When we're on a period, the follicular phase, the ovulation phase, the luteal phase. And you may have noticed that sometimes in the month, then you can absolutely crush the gym. You're keeping up with everyone else in the class and you're getting maybe some PRs with your weight training. But other times of the month, you don't feel like going at all. Maybe you're pushing through, you're really struggling. You go into the back of the class because you just can't keep up. And that's not you being weak or being a baby. That's your hormones changing and needing different things throughout the month. So 
my approach to exercise I personally do this and find it to be really beneficial and a lot of my clients do as well but basically you're changing up and switching up the types of exercise that you do throughout the month based on where you're at if you're on birth control or you don't have a period then this is going to be a little bit difficult because you don't have a, a natural cycle that fluctuates throughout the month but you could give it a go so when you're on your period you really want to dial it back and give your body the time to rest because having a period is a really energy intensive process it requires a lot of energy and nutrients to build up and then expel all of this uterine tissue and it can really take it out of you especially if you're dealing with heavy heavy periods um the draining aspect of that and the low iron that can come about because of that can be a problem so during that time I really like to take it easy go for walks only stretching and resting sleeping a lot spend your, the time that you do at the gym doing some self-care instead so having an Epsom salt bath maybe sleeping in a bit more that will do your body a lot more benefit and then after your period the one or two weeks after that your energy levels are starting to increase again your estrogen and you're preparing for ovulation so your energy levels will be a lot higher and you'll be more energetic at the gym so that's the time when you can push it a little bit further in the long run maybe give yourself a break from doing things like that for the next couple of weeks but then turn into more cycle thinking when your energy levels are higher then you can push it a little bit more at the gym and still stick with the maximum five days a week I really don't want you pushing it too much in the gym make sure you're refueling optimally after ovulation your hormones level your hormone levels stay quite high and they plateau for a while so again you can get away with more of the strength training the heavier lifting progesterone should ideally be higher at this point as well and as that starts to lower they start to taper down as we start to approach your next period then again your energy levels may start to wear down a little bit you may have a little bit more pms or mood swings so that's the time to bring it back down a little bit sticking with walking yoga easier strength training sessions less increases in heart rate for that those few days to a few weeks again there's the whole guide on my website that doesn't just go into the exercise side of things it goes into the nutrition as well and all of this information should be taken lightly and not be the bible or shouldn't be the rule to follow it's just basically a guide that helps you figure out what works for you and some weeks when i'm on my period i feel absolutely fine and i really want to do a hard intense workout so i do and then some weeks when i'm in my ovulation phase i should be feeling more energized and ready to work hard in the gym but i feel not so great because maybe i've got a headache or i've not slept well so that's what i listen to as well just listen to different things and not take things so strictly if this still doesn't help and you change your exercise and you're still not seeing results in terms of weight loss then i would investigate other things so your thyroid function is really important especially if you start to notice that your weight gain isn't just located in the abdomen it's located all over the body and this could be hypothyroidism so your thyroid is your master metabolism gland and when that starts to slow down then everything in the body can slow down so your metabolic rate the rate at which you burn through your food that you're consuming your hair growth your bowel function your mental health can all become more sluggish so that would require some further testing from your gp make sure they test a full thyroid panel which includes not just your tsh and t4 but your t3 reverse levels and your hot your antibodies as well i'd also investigate into your estrogen to progesterone ratio because if you're quote estrogen dominant either you're not ovulating or you're not producing enough progesterone in the second half of your cycle then that could lead to weight gain or weight loss resistance as can high cortisol or your cortisol pattern could be off so maybe you're producing too much cortisol at the wrong time of day not enough in the morning too much of at the night and this can really throw off your hormones your metabolism and your weight 
but personally i really feel like the exercise is the issue and just being less controlling less restricting giving yourself more rest eating more moving less moving in a different way i think that's the way to go about things so i hope you find that helpful i hope this has been eye-opening to a few people because i always need to break the myth that more exercise is better and even though you're eating healthy it must be the exercise that's the problem and that's not true at all so please give me an update if you implement some of these strategies and you feel better or you feel worse i love it when you send me an email follow up sharing how you've gotten on with the protocol so again this isn't medical advice listen to your doctor but this is just providing with information that will hopefully be healthy helpful and point you in the right direction as to what to do next that's all for today i'm going to carry on with client calls i'm actually getting really busy with clients recently but i do have a few availabilities for consultations this month so if you're interested in becoming a client i have i think three availability for two or three more clients this month um before i get fully booked up so just shoot me an email if that's something you're interested in booking for your free call free 30 minute call to discuss if you've got any questions before you go ahead i hope you enjoyed this podcast and we'll be back next week with another really good episode i think you're going to enjoy that one it's actually one of the the episodes that i've been wanting to record for a long time so i think you're going to enjoy it i hope you have a good week and i'll speak to you soon thank you for listening to another episode of the hormones in harmony podcast if you like this episode please leave me a rating and review as this helps to spread the word to other women dealing with hormone imbalances as a massive thank you gift i'll send you a free guide six steps to hormonal harmony all you need to do is screenshot your rating and review then email it to me at hormonesinharmony at gmail.com and I'll send you the link to download this free guide. If you haven't already, check out my website vivanaturalhealth.co.uk and Instagram page at vivanaturalhealth for tons more free content and inspiration. You can also schedule a free 30-minute hormone troubleshooting call to find out the next steps to take in order to overcome your symptoms naturally. See you back here next week for another episode.